Cyril Stova. Now, just last week, on the 29th of May, Nigerians marked another Democracy Day. Uh, the celebrations provided a platform to appraise three years of the Buhari administration as it continues to shape the nation's economy and strategically position it for sustainable development and industrialization. Now, the identified achievements include the fight against corruption, infrastructural development, and social investment programs. Tonight, we continue with our in-depth analyses and discussions on the path to growth and overall development, which is the focus of this administration. But first, let's get to see this report by Kenneth Nanim. Nigeria's fourth republic has come a long way that children born around the time of his advent are old enough to start thinking of aspiring to run for political office. It was, however, a journey that began with apprehension due to the long years of military dictatorship and many failed promises to return power to civilians. As expected, there were trial and errors occasioned by the new freedom of expression, rule of law and order privileges in the world's most accepted form of governance. Impeachment of leadership of national and state houses of assembly became order of the day, just as some governors also fell to the power of constitutional democracy. The ballot is now the only source of power in Nigeria, especially at the federal and state levels. Politics is a culture. When we say something is a culture, it means it's a combination of behavior, action, attitude, okay, manners. Politics entail that things should be done in certain ways. From three political parties in 1999, the country now has 68. Nigeria has had five successive elections since their return to democracy with a smooth transition of power from one political party to another in 2015, being the zenith of the country's democratic practice. 19 years of uninterrupted democratic governance has not only led to the creation of many agencies but also institutions to facilitate good governance. Nigeria has regained her pride of place amongst Committee of Nations. In fact, the country is now a front-runner in entrenching democracy in many countries, especially in West Africa. Discipline and strategic implementation of policies have seen the country exit recession, accumulate highest foreign reserves in five years, rated amongst top 10 global reformers and champion of 2018 Africa anti corruption war. We need to unite the whole of Africa to kill corruption, and that is exactly what is happening. It's a tough battle, but it's a battle that we must win. What this means is that Nigeria is taking the lead in tackling the issue of corruption in Africa. Fight against insurgency has also experienced a remarkable success. <laughs> From the environment, economy, infrastructure to other social and political endeavors, Nigeria, many say, has lived up to expectations in the last three years. Well, that report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Let's introduce our guest to you as we prepare to take in the discussions on uh, how far with Niger's development this past three years. We'd like to welcome to this program uh, Buba Galadima. is a former National Secretary, Congress for Progressive Change, CPC. That's the old CPC. As a member of the Board of Trustees of the APC, and a member of the National Caucus of the APC. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, sir. All right. We're also joined by Festus Kayama, a senior advocate of Nigeria. He is director of strategic communications of the Buhari 2019 presidential campaign. Thanks for being here tonight. Thank you for inviting me. All right. We'd also like to welcome Dr. Tunja Abayomi, a constitutional lawyer. Dr. Abayomi, it's nice to have you with us tonight once again. Thank you. And uh, also joining us here in Abuja is Farouk Adamu Aliu, a former member of the House of Representatives. Thanks for being here. Well, also joining us from our Lagos Network Center is uh, Senator Ola Runimbe Mamura, a former member of the Senate. Thank you for being with us tonight, Senator Mamura. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. All right. 
Okay, as we always do, we acquaint you with the procedure of uh, the program. At the appropriate time, you can get to join in the discussion in the studio. The various platforms will be on your screen. We advise you take advantage of them. However, for those who will be phoning in, and we say this every Tuesday without fail, for those who will be phoning in at the appropriate time, once your call gets through to the studio, do us a favor, turn down the volume of your TV set. Just reduce the volume. That's the way to avoid the hurlback or the echo. And the best way to know that your call has been passed through to the studio is you'll see your name on screen. Once you see your name written on the screen, it means your call is through to the studio. We advise that you go straight to the point, you ask your question or make your comment. Don't bother too much about the greetings, just go straight to the point. And we also advise that you keep it as short and straightforward as possible so that others can also get on the platform and make their contributions. So once again, thank you for joining us tonight on NTA Tuesday Live. Three years of change and tonight we'll also look at how far and uh, what are the achievements and what are the challenges. Let's start off tonight and uh, put this question to our guests and say it's been 19 years on general note on broken democracy. How has Nigeria fared within this period? Me? Yes, let's start from you. Thank that. you, Federal. Uh, <laughs> first, I would want to express my shock and surprise that I would be one that, that is sitting on NTA that I had not watched for 19 years. Really? Yes. <coughs> Why not? Several reasons. Okay. Uh, I don't want to go into that. All right. I am here and uh, I appreciate the invitation. When I was invited, I never thought it was real. Mm. Here I am. Right. So here Before I came, I had a series of arguments with those before me in my house. Most of them thought, was it a setup to extract certain words from your mouth that will lead to your detention? <laughs> or is it a real invitation to discuss the realities of our moment? And when I was coming, uh, Sir Mike Adeju, a very close friend of mine, uh, told me that ask the producer or the NTA managing director whether he has written his letter of, I mean, he has written letter of his resignation by inviting you to, in, to participate in this program. I said, I will find out. So here I am, and I think there are a lot to discuss in the country. We are on age. There are a lot of contemporary things happening. Uh, for me, some of them are not what we have bargained for. Because we've been in these trenches to bring about this government for a long time. From January 2002 to date. And it was our hope that even if there is nothing, we will strengthen institutions such that no strong man, however powerful he is, would be more powerful than the institutions of government. But here we are today. The actors in this field are not behaving to history. And some of the things happening, for me, is near, is, I can call them disappointing. Disappointing in the sense that uh, for example, we demean the name of the president, we demean the institution of the National Assembly, we demean, for example, the institution of the police for several reasons which ought not to be. Uh, we will learn from history. If any of us had known Tafa Bologun and how he had behaved on some of us, locked us up, did many things to us because we were in the opposition, and suddenly we found him crawling beneath a car, shouting for help. Then many people, before they act, when they are in a, position, in a transient position of authority, they have to be a little bit careful. All right. 
Okay, we'll come to the specifics. But um, like you say, generally, it's a mixed bag for you. And uh, maybe this point... Meaning maybe. that there is progress because NTA can invite somebody like me to okay. participate in this progress, Fine. in this program. That's right. a progress. All right, good. We'll get down to the specifics. But let's come to Professor Skiyama, the uh, senior advocate who's here with us. Well, um, the question is um, 19 years of unbroken hmm. democracy, uh, the story so far. For me, I think when this story is told years later, I think, um, you know, in the history of a country, there's what you call the watershed. Watershed is where something stops, a trend stops, and another one takes off. If the history of this country is written later, and especially this democratic experience, I think we got to a watershed in 2015. And with this administration, another phase altogether took off. Why do I say so? Because there was significant change in 2015, both in personnel, in the approach to doing things, especially the approach to the economy, the approach to the fight against corruption, and a few other things. So in 19 years of unbroken democracy, we have seen situations of wasted opportunities. We have seen situations of big you know, promises, huge resources, wasted opportunities. And right now, for me, I think for the first time in 50 years in this country, despite the challenges, we have some focus, we have some direction, and I have never been so hopeful, Cyril. I've never been so excited about the future of this country, especially with policies that are put in place now. If these policies are maintained, if these policies are pursued with single-mindedness, I think uh, we are headed somewhere. I've never been so hopeful. All right. And what's And uh, Dr. Bayomi, you were with us um, last week. Uh, yeah. So, take it off from where we left off and uh, seeing uh, how far we have come. Is it also some disappointment <coughs> for you? Well, I believe it to be well with Nigeria nation. A nation is not judged by singular achievements, by a singular achievement. Uh, I think if we rate the nation from the sector of governance, we have maintained democracy for quite a while now. That in itself is commendable. Those of us that fought against military dictatorship, at least we have some level of freedom and um, uh, human rights. And I believe that we have some control in terms of participation of the people in the affairs of the nation. As far as I'm concerned, those are all progr progressive moves. And I think both the people of Nigeria and the leaders deserve some commendation. That is not to say that we have reached the zenith of our expectation as a people. But I don't think we can say that the situation of Nigeria is hopeless. We can say it is hopeful. But a whole lot need to be done. We are obviously going to the mountaintop. I think we are, it's going to be quite an effort to climb that mountain. But it will be wrong. And in my view, totally unwarranted to give up hope in the nation. Okay. Well, you. Thank you very much. Well, let me let me stay within the three years of change. Um, the people of this country have certainly witnessed change. My senior brother Buba Galadima spoke about being invited to NTA. 
and uh, behold, he's here. So this is the kind of change we're talking about. This is the first time in this country that an organization like NTA will have no interference. The government of the day will not decide who you invite, what dis to discuss, and so on and so forth. And NTA also, for the first time, does not sing praises of government all the time. You know, so that's one thing. Then two, <clears throat> this is also the first time in the history of this country that you have a government in place that allows everybody to practice to do whatever he or she wants as a free citizen. This is the first time also in this country that you have a sitting president who will ask every employee to do what he or she is ask, ask, ascribed to do. Now, you find out that we're not used to that. When we used to allowing people, you know, do what they are supposed to do. That's why you find that, uh, like, the crisis we're having politically. If it were before, the government of the day would have probably unleashed, you know, agents of coercion. But I, I can even give an example of, of myself. During the third term issue, some of us were waylaid. Now, this is a country that the, the, the government that has allowed various government agencies to carry out their constitutional duties. If you do it rightly, so be it. If you do it wrongly, you will be held responsible. So at least this is the change in the right direction where people or government agencies are allowed to do what they are supposed to do. Thanks a lot. We'll come to some of the issues you raised, but let's go over to our Lagos Network Center and uh, speak with uh, Senator Mamura. Well, I do know for, for, for sure that, uh, Senator, you've been on the NTA many times and you've aired your views freely without anyone stopping you from doing that. I know that for sure. <laughs> Siri, yes, that is very true. And... Um, let me also join my colleagues uh, over there to say that um, the issue before us, um, 19 years of uh, uh, non-interruption in any way of the democratic process, I think it's something to cheer. And um, I always say that, remind ourselves that democracy is not a destination. Democracy is a process, and uh, it becomes self-refining based on uh, new realities, based on new experiences, and uh, we all need to continue to work at it. So, to the extent that uh, for the first time we're having this long, relatively long, 19 years, is something to cheer, like I said earlier on. Having said that, I want to believe that uh, what we need to work more on uh, is our institutions, the institutions of democracy, the judiciary, the legislature, the executive, the civil service, the security services, the media. I think reasonably we have a free press, which is very critical to democracy. So when you put all this together, you will say that um, we, are, we are not doing badly as a nation. Yes, uh, we are not saying that everything has been smooth, that we haven't had our, I mean, the rough edges, but then we need to continue to work at these things. Again, I think the 2015 election is quite significant because that was the first time in the history of this country that you will have the opposition taking over from the ruling party. It never happened before. And that is something to cheer as well. So, uh, so far, so fair, we're going to work at it all, I mean, together. And uh, we also need to work towards building what I call shared national vision. 
because it is when we have a shared national vision, that is when whoever is there will not matter because we already have a shared vision that whoever is there at a given point in time will follow in the best interest of Nigeria and Nigerians. All right, thank you so much. We'll return to you in a moment. But um, let's begin to look at some of the specifics now. And uh, let's stay a little longer on the political landscape. Would you describe it now as all-inclusive level? Are we developing the kind of uh, political culture that will stead this country uh, in a good position for the future? Well, sir, uh, <coughs> let me say... It's very difficult to talk on specific legal terms when there are legal luminaries like uh, Dr. Tunji Festus around. Uh, as most Nigerians know, we have three arms of government, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. And of the three, the executive is the weakest. Is the weakest. While the legislature have the constitutional responsibility to make laws for the good governance of the country and has supervisory role on the activities by oversight functions on the executive. And the judiciary has an overall responsibility to mediate between private individuals and these arms of government or between the arms of government. The executive doesn't have such powers at all over the other two arms of government. Maybe I can be corrected by the constitutional lawyer who is here. So I regard this as the executive is the weakest of the three. Now, we have certain things at stake, which started during the tenure of General Obasanjo. Uh, he had his excesses, he had his weak points, that even led to an attempt to impeach him by the legislature. And definitely, Nigerians know that he was thoroughly rattled. Thoroughly rattled. In fact, he had to invite his former colleagues, other statesmen, uh, President Shagari, General Yakubu Gawan, to mediate and get him off the hook. Because the legislature had such powers especially Gali Naamba, that they wanted to really cut him to size. I said, today, despite an attempt by the legislature to exert their authority, their constitutional responsibility, they are hindered. Because I read in a newspaper just before coming here that they invited the legislature or the Senate invited some key pass personnel of government, namely the Minister of Petroleum Resources and the Minister of Finance. And they decided not to come. In civilized climb, that could have earned them a straight sack. But unfortunately, it is not yet Uhuru for some of us because we, we fought for social justice, we fought for mm. Free, not only freedom of expression, but freedom of rights all our lives. Yet, we are not seeing this at the end of the tunnel. Why? If any arm of government is not allowed to carry its constitutional responsibility, then we are heading for chaos. Law courts give judgments which are not obeyed. In a civilized country, like the ones we, we selfishly want to copy, oh, like it's done in America, oh, it's like it's done in Britain. If the courts say anything, the president will be shivering to obey. But here, ordinary servants in government will, will decide not to, they will choose whether to obey or not to obey, depending on the body language of their superiors. This would not augur well.
we want to build strong institutions, not only the arms of government, that will stand out and decisions made by them are taken. If the investigator in the U.S. can order that all Trump's uh, uh, properties across the country should be, should be, should be, should be uh, checked by the FBI because they were looking for an evidence whether there was any nexus between the accusation that Russia interfered with the elections in U.S. And that was done. I just want to see if any court can give, a, can give directives that any governor or chairman of a local government can be investigated in that manner and it stands. So it's not yet Uhuru, okay. as we may seem or think we are getting somewhere. Of course we are getting somewhere. We are making progress, but not that progress that would have been there by now. So what are those things that are standing in the place, uh, standing in the path of uh, building strong institutions? Is it that the politics is uh, interfering with um, firming up our institutions or? Well, you talked about political culture. Yes. I wanted to look at it from a different perspective. When you say whether 19 years mm -hmm. has afforded us the opportunity to build some kind of political culture. And I think you use the phrase whether the level playing mm -hmm. field, whether the level playing field. And I thought the angle from which you asked that question is access to power mm -hmm. by different uh, groups and the type of tolerance, you know, we have um, within the system. So I would like to answer it from that um, angle. And I think that my, my major worry is still that the political culture still allows a lot of, you know, money. Uh, it's heavily monetized. So much so that we still have a situation where people spend so much to assess power during campaigns, um, especially during primaries, you know, within the parties. You won't believe that at times even the money they spend in primaries is even money they spend, is more than the money they spend you know, in the main elections, because they say a delicate, like uh, Abiola said, MQ Abiola said one time, said a delegate affair is always a delicate affair, you know, where you spend so much money. So I am still worried about that type of political culture where we spend so much. And um, uh, that is also one of my worry about the, you know, not too young to run bill that was passed. And I was telling somebody recently, I said, are, are you sure that the rush with which the elites and those in power in the National Assembly rushed to pass this bill. Are you sure they are not passing it for the benefit of their children? You know, because I think the excitement, we took the excitement overboard a bit. When they said a 25, a 30 year old can assess certain political offices, do you think it's the, the, the children of me, you know, the poor who are still looking for jobs at that stage? It should be the children of the rich that just left university. They don't have anything to do, but the father has a lot, enough money to put them in public offices. So we still have, it's not about passing the not too young to run bill. There's still a lot to do about money politics. How do we remove that political culture? How do we, you know, recalibrate it in such a way that people can assess political office without spending so much? Another worry I have about the political culture is about ethnicity and religion that has crept into our political culture. So much so that people want to assess power from the platform of the ethnicity and the platform of religion. And we've seen that in the past 19 years, where people, you know, raise all kinds of sentiments, political sentiments, you know, uh, from religious angle and uh, ethnic angle. It's just to assess power. And when they assess power, they forget even the platform upon which they campaigned. People who say they are true Christians, they, they, they are Christians and they want to assess power because they are Christians. Those positions are reserved for Christians. When they get there, they don't profess to be true Christians. When people say they are Muslims and they want to assess position because they are Muslims, when they get there, they don't profess to be true Muslims. And so on and so forth. Some people say, okay, certain positions should be assessed because they are from this part of the country. Does it mean that when you are now in that office, like maybe a minister of aviation, and you are an Igbo man or Hausa man, Yoruba man, people from your ethnic group will not pay for flight ticket again. Because so, these things don't make sense to me at times. They don't make sense. So 
this kind of political culture, I think, is still a challenge. The money politics, ethnic and religious politics, it's still a challenge, you know, for us. And I think we need to work on some of these things. All right, Dr. Abayo, maybe from who, how do you see this? What perspective uh, do you see this? Uh, I think it's important to recognize that um, poverty is a threat to democracy. And uh, in the midst of um, uncaring poverty, it is difficult to have good government. A whole lot of the problem of Nigeria is actually uh, a factor of poverty. A whole lot of things don't work well because the people of a na the nation, they are poor. A nation is rich when it has rich people. But when a nation has a whole lot of poor people, you find that that nation will remain poor. Unfortunately, the truth of the matter is that naturally the nation is endowed with great possibilities. Um, you, unfortunately, again, a whole lot of our leaders have actually underdeveloped Nigeria because of breach of trust. Because if we take a look at this nation at the beginning of this great journey, and I'm talking of getting out of... Uh, getting out of um, colonialism and beginning its independent existence. This is one of the nations that is considered to be the nation of the future. I always give the example of a prince, my principal, who was the son of an Italian general, mm -hmm. Goy Garigillo, the son of an Italian general. He was in Cambridge, the leading university in Europe, and they needed a mathematics teacher in Nigeria a little bit before independence. The family was very happy to surrender him to Nigeria because they saw this nation as one of the great nations of the future. Right. But now we found, I asked him a while ago what happened. He said the nation suddenly disappeared. So the other issue is that the nation, great nations also have great people as mentors. Now, in our nation, if we take away the initial leaders at independence, independent leaders, we appear to have lost people who are willing to stand on strong values <coughs> and take a position. That's why, for example, what Festus is talking about, that's why we have that problem. Money politics, people cannot, the people are so impoverished, they, they, they will go to any extent in order to, 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 to have that money. A, a hungry mind or mouth that cannot understand the language of persuasion. So if we are going to make progress in Nigeria, one important aspect that the government must work upon is the economy of this nation so that the nation can work well for the people of Nigeria. Okay, so somehow both are linked. The kind of uh, politics you play because you to a large extent, we'll have to determine how you run your economy. There are also political factors. So, See, let, let me look at it from another angle of uh, elites, the political elites of this country. We are the problem of this country. Because, you see, when it comes to stealing money, when it comes to sharing, mm. we are one and the same. There is no difference between an Igbo man or a Fulani man or somebody from Bielsa. We sit down together, share the national resources, and then go back to our villages and tell them, look, that Christian is not good or that Muslim is not good. Now, we have, we, the elites, have beaten the masses so bad that, so shamefully, this government is trying to show that, look, these are your enemies. When people are taken to court, citizens will come out on the street I mean, when government is asking, look, we are suspecting elite A has taken this of yours. Now, instead of the people to ensure that, look, is it true or not? But we, the elites, will sit down and make sure that people come on the street to demonstrate because an elite is being challenged to explain source of wealth. So, so really... 
You see, I want the masses to first of all understand. I, Farouk Adamo Ali, a Fulani man from Chikawa, and Festus Kayamo from Delta, I family. He visited me some two weeks back in my hometown in Birni Kudu. I mean, so if any Fulani man in Jigawa sees a Christian from the other part of the country as his enemy, the masses of this country should know that, look, it is not true. Now we have somebody in the president who has come to say, look, let me fight the elites for the first time. Let me challenge you, the elites. Let me, you know, of course there are mistakes here and there. Of course there are things that are excessive. Of course there are certain things certain government agencies do wrongly. But in good faith, the masses of this country should understand that there is a change. We are used, I mean, like before three years ago, we are not used to this kind of thing where elites will be taken to court. Because it's a new thing. It's a new thing that, look, governors, former governors, and so on. And look, for those who say that only those in opposition, one day, someday, we in APC will not be in government. So let the government in power go after us. Which means if we continue this cycle, that if you know you come into power and steal and do things that are not right just because you are protected, someday, one day, you will leave power. So if we continue like this, someday, you will not see a corrupt government official. So to me, this is a challenge that the masses, not also, the masses need to understand that, look, the government of the day is trying, with some mistakes here and there, to look, who are your enemies? Your elites, they are one and the same. Our political elites are one and the same. So I call on all of us, the elites, first of all, to have the fear of God because we are people of faith. You know that one day you will die. As a Muslim, when you die, you will, the total burial cost of a Muslim is probably 500 or 1,000 naira. The total cost of a Christian, I mean, rich Christian would be millions. But to the dead person, to the dead Muslim or dead Christian, is one and the same. So the earlier we understand that, look, there should be change. We, let's cooperate. Where the government is going wrong, let's all of us unite in unison as one people. You don't say a hearts man just because he is a hearts man. All of a sudden, I mean, you have forgotten the life of a thief man and life of a full animal. It's one and the same. We shouldn't play politics with people's lives or livelihood. We, like, like, like let me give an example of Benue State. Benue State is an APC state. So whatever happens in Benue State, the projection is that APC is failing in that state. But some people are giving it religious and sectional interpretation. Now, and you find out that some of our leaders, maybe the governor of my state is not performing well, he will try to hide behind certain things. So these are the things that I need the masses to start checking us, the elites. All right, our first caller is already on the line. We have uh, calling in from Uma here, Joseph. Hello, Joseph, go ahead. <coughs> Joseph from Uma here. Yeah, good evening. Good evening. By the moderator, and good evening, gentlemen. Hmm. Yeah, uh, please, I want to say that uh, I think by now, uh, the Nigerian politicians, to fix and join President Muhammad Buhari, to know that he has come to develop Nigeria political system into another way, for we to cue in with what is happening in the United States of America and the developed world. And uh, in such a way, they should try to imbibe and know that the interest of Nigeria is important, and the interest of the citizens is important. One of the problems we have been facing all these years is that the politicians have not been realized what politics is all about. That what they come to is, what they think about is how to make their own selfish money, how to steal Nigeria public funds and then go away by fighting out or using out all forms of uh, tricks, uh, developing all sorts of uh, uh, ethnicity, religiosity, and the rest of them. But we must know that patriotism, Patriotism, bettering of our country, bettering the citizens, 
should be in the what word of every politician. But what they think of is how to loot the treasury. If you look at the problem of President Buhari now, the problem is the corruption that has been eating this into the fabrics of the politicians. And now he made them. The same group of crop of people are still there, especially in the House of Assembly. And they are disturbing. Say, no, Buhari cannot implement change in Nigeria. It will not happen. That's what they are telling him. And he himself do not know how to wage this war. But we believe that we believe that when sanctity is being placed, I think everybody should follow up the order. For an instance, Nigeria is practicing a presidential system of government now, no parliamentary system of government. And in the presidential system of government, all the appointees of the government remain with the executive for goodness sake. They are not answerable to the legislature. They are answerable to the president. No. And in such deal, uh, whatever decision and whatever things with the House of Assembly are done, uh, if you check on, the problem now is that they are trying to take over the uh, actions of the executive <coughs> by inviting most of the executive uh, officials unnecessarily. That's parliamentary system of government, whereby the government is still... The executive is fused into the legislature. Whatever thing they are doing, they are doing it. So we are, what we are trying to say is that those of them who are politicians should try to know exactly the system of government they are practicing and know exactly where their power lies and where their powers end. I think there should be a kind of harmony between the legislature and the executive. But that should be when true people are being elected into public office. And... Uh, the the sanctity which we are talking about with this place. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph, from uh, here. Um, well, well, we'll go straight over to our Lagos Network Center and ask uh, Senator Mamura. Well, you listen to um, Joseph there and uh, some of the things he said. Perhaps you just respond to that. And when we come back to Abuja, we'll ask uh, both uh, 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 the senior advocate here and the constitutional lawyer to put us in true perspective if those things are the way he said them. But Senator, over to you. Well, uh, thank you once again, Cyril. Yes, I listened to my colleagues over there and the last uh, man that phoned in. Uh, I think the first thing to say in terms of political culture, which was the issue you raised earlier on, um, I think most importantly to, for us to uh, appreciate is... Um, one of the most important pillars of democracy, which is the rule of law. The rule of law is critical. And um, to that extent, everybody in the system, particularly practitioners, must learn to submit to the rule of law. It's very, very important. I have always argued again that the fault is not in our stars. The fault is in us as practitioners, particularly the political elite. The issue of religion was mentioned earlier on, the issue of ethnicity. It is the elite that manipulate religion, ethnicity for their own selfish purposes. That is the political elite, not the common man on the street. So, when it is convenient, and it is, of course it's an issue of convenience, this issue of religion is thrown in, this issue of uh, ethnicity is thrown in, just to achieve certain uh, selfish ends. The second thing to say is the issue of uh, values in the system. By virtue of my own position, in the last presidential election as the Deputy Director General, I had countless sessions with individuals and groups of people explaining the whole concept of the change mantra. And it's, you know, essentially it comprises of three components. The first is a rebirth, 
the national rebirth. A new way, when you talk of rebirth, something new, a new way of doing things. The second component is uh, rebuild. And what are we rebuilding? We are rebuilding the institutions in the system. The institutions that hold democracy. Because individuals come, individuals go. But in, the institutions will remain to sustain democracy. So we need to rebuild the broken walls or dilapidated walls of our institutions. The third issue is restoration. And what are we restoring? We are restoring values to the system. Because the values, the values that some of us grew up with, are, you know, they have been totally degraded, so to speak, because of years of not doing things the right way. So these are the components of change that we talk about in APC, which the present government is trying as much as possible to achieve. We must restore values in the system. Honesty, integrity, good liberalness, and of course, be your, you know, being your, big, uh, your, your, your brother's keeper. It doesn't matter who that your brother is, it doesn't matter who that your neighbor is, whether Fulani, whether Yoruba, whether Igbo, it's your neighbor. So these are the things that will hold us together as a nation, and then we can then build our democracy gradually over time. All right. Okay. Let me respond to that corner. Okay. You know, because I have the instinct in yes. the parliament. Yes. Yeah. has struck me. Now, I have an advice for the government. You see, the government needs to ensure whenever National Assembly calls any member of the executive, must must, must appear, honestly. And also the members of National Assembly should know there are some trivialities, there are some issues that they don't need to call people. And because the members of the parliament are also closer to the people than even those in the executive. Because the members of the parliament, when they go to their constituencies, I mean the constituents know them, not a minister, not you know all these big guys in government. So I, I think the government of the day should ensure. In fact, government should penalize any minister who refuses to answer call of National Assembly. Yeah. All right. Well, there's also the issue about uh, whether people are a bit confused about the parliamentary or the executive system of government or... Uh, Dr. Abayomi, uh, is it that <coughs> um, the legislature within this period has been overstepping its bounds? Well... Uh, has been acting within its constitutional uh, uh, I think, uh, provision. I think it's quite important for the legislative department to understand its job and not to confuse it with the job of the executive. Uh, if we take this issue of invitation, hmm. often it's just totally unwarranted in my view. All right, let, let me just ask you to hold on a while and yes. continue in a minute. Yes. Um, I'm just calling from Kaduna here. Um, a caller from Kaduna. Hello? Well, I... Hello, good evening, sir. Hello, good evening, sir. Yes. Hello, good evening, sir. Yeah, good evening. Go right ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead. You're Hello. on. Hello, good evening, sir. Well, I think and we'll just sir, return. Sir, good evening. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, uh, I will say good evening to the guest. Hello. Hello. Well, it's, it, it seems so I would have, have to ask the caller to uh, try again some other time so we can, we can get out with the, uh, with the discussion. So right. the point I'm making is that legislative invitation is supposed to be purposeful. Okay. Legis no legislative department has unlimited uh, privilege to just invite people in the executive. Otherwise, the executive will not be able to do its job. If we look at the Constitution, this imperfect constitution, and of course, you know, 
I have said again and again that one of the fundamental problems of this nation is that this nation has never agreed. The peoples of this nation have never come together to agree on how they want to be governed. Because it is not a government that gives a nation a constitution. It is a constitution that gives a nation a government. In the case of Nigeria, it is always a government that gave us a constitution. And it is never the content of a constitution that validates it. It is the procedure of making a constitution. So that's one of the fundamental problems of our nation in the sense that our people have never, in freedom, come together. How really do they want to be governed? We have constitutions that are forced on us. Having said that, if you look at this imperfect constitution, that section 88 and 89, it says the legislative department, for the purposes of making law and improving, basically thinking of the interests of the people, can invite <coughs> people. But you now have a situation where the legislative department has turned itself, with due respect, to an irritant, <laughs> continually disturbing the currents of executive work. It goes even overboard. It takes away what is called constituency uh, um, funds, which it has no power to take on that law. It gives itself the power to make budget. Because when you input constituency funds into a budget, that means you are budgeting and also approving budget, which is contrary to the basic fundamentals of democracy. So when you are looking at this issue, it is important for the legislative department to understand that they don't have unlimited power. They are also bound by the law and the constitution. As a matter of fact, like I have always said, a government, an executive department has no other job. The only job is if you take away the appointment of ambassadors, prerogative of mercy, appointment of ministers, a president has only one job, to execute the laws and the constitution. And that means that he can also execute it over the legislative department. So when you look at the legislative department, in my view, in this nation, the legislative department still needs to understand its job. But I admit that Nigeria as a nation is going through what I would call a period of democratic testing. But we are making progress. Right. Mr. Kevin. <laughs> well, what comes to play really is section, um, sections 88 and 89 of the 1999 Constitution. And um, if you look at those provisions, those provisions are say, I say that in the course of doing its work, the National Assembly has passed to summon anybody. All right. Okay. Now, it, it, but it doesn't end there. It says in summoning anybody to answer questions, it has to be for two purposes. One, in the process of making law, lawmaking, and then two, in order to expose waste and corruption, All right. and on we'll, and on. We'll just so, ask you to hold on a while yes. there, and we'll take it up again. Uh, hello, um, we have a caller from Benway, yeah? Hello. Yes, go ahead. Hello, hello. are you still with us? Uh, good evening. Yes, good evening. Good evening. Go right ahead. Hello. Oh, dear. Paul, you're on air. Your name is on air, so just go straight Hello, away. Hello, Isaac. Okay. Um, I want to uh, analyze the issue of the three years of change. Mm. The three years of change, which is quite progressive. Mm. And, uh, but what is lacking in uh, this change mantra is the issue of uh, national integration and this uh, lack of national integration is because of the disunity among the three arms of government. Most especially the National Assembly, they are more disorganized. They are not cooperating with the uh, federal government, the executive at all, because of so many reasons that uh, 
that that are personal to them because of uh, selfish ambition, greedness, and corrupt attitude. The problem of our political system is because they don't have a political ideology. The political ideology is lacking in uh, 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 three arms of government. If had it been we have political ideology, we will be working in one direction, like political culture. We will be following the culture. The culture is a way of life, a way that, that is a, a pertaining to behavioral pattern of a life of a society. But because there is no focus, no ideology, and no political culture, that is why the country is not in the country is not having a focus on what actually we are pursuing. The, 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 the problem is the political operative of this country, but the uh, the the the, the, uh, the followers have done their own part. We have elected our leaders, but the problem now is the uh, the problem with our leaders. Our leaders are not uh, properly carrying out their functional roles, which are supposed to benefit. Uh, the, 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 the indigents of our country. Okay. So please, I want to uh, conclude by saying that greed, uh, uh, the selfish ambition over ambition has beclouded the mind of our uh, National Assembly members. That is why there is always a rift, there is always rift, disagreement between the executive and the, 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 the legislature in this country. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much. Well, it, it seems to tie up um, in some parts with uh, the points you were trying to make. So we'll just let you finish that quickly. Yes. Uh, so when we realize that Section 88, Subsection 2, has limited the reasons for which the legislature can exercise its powers, then we must agree with Dr. Bonomi in one respect alone, that the powers are not at large, really. They are not at large to say just anybody for any reason should can be invited. But that does not mean that we should not show abs absolute respect for the legislature. The executive must show absolute respect for the legislature because they are there really to act as checks and balances, you know, for what um, most of these um, uh, departments of governments they, they do to overlook them and, you know, and uh, oversee what they do. However, if we do agree, therefore, that there is a limit, there are conditions upon which you can invite, that means there are instances where the powers can be abused, where they go overboard, and there are instances where they still they are within their powers. So I think we need to take each individual case. You can, we cannot make a blanket statement sitting down here. There are many cases that have arisen, especially this last three years. So we have to take them one by one. This is not a forum for that, right. really, to know where, in, you know, in certain cases they exceeded their powers or didn't exceed their powers. But let me say one very important thing that most of these committees do, and I say that with all respect to members of the legislature. You cannot, for instance, sit in a committee, take a resolution, and tell the executive that this resolution, in respect of its officers, must be obeyed. They don't have such powers. Section 88 did not give them such powers. They will say, for example, we have investigated this person, this man heading this agency must be sacked. There is no such powers. Let us just stop it here today. Let's, and this is, this is look, Cyril, with all respect, like I said, I respect the legislature a lot. But these are the instances where they now incur the wrath of the executive. The people, members of the public now undermine them because of certain things like that they do. But let them just keep within the power. They have enormous powers. Let them just keep within those powers. They will have the respect that they deserve. And I say, and I want to encourage the executive to please accord that respect to the legislature that they deserve. But the legislature themselves too should not overshoot the runway as okay. it is. All right, thank you so much. We'll take a short break here. When we return, We'll look at how much progress has been made in the fight against corruption and also in ensuring security of lives and properties. Stay with us on NTA Tuesday Live. We'll be back shortly.
Sinoni Restaurant, serving authentic, delicious, and healthy Chinese cuisine. Nigerians, our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military are winning the war against Boko Haram. Today, all occupied territories have been recovered and Boko Haram has been degraded. Our affected brothers and sisters are getting their lives back. However, they are now after you and me. In our mosques, churches, schools, motor parks, markets, entertainment centers, and public gatherings. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects, and movements to the police and other security agencies. The security of our nation is a duty for you and me. Nigeria Unite Against Terrorism. This message is brought to you by the Federal Ministry of Information and Culture. The struggle for independence had been a long and tough one. Our founding fathers and compatriots sacrificed their comfort and even shed their blood. We cannot at this point in history afford to spirit away their sacrifices for immediate but temporary gains of today. Let us emphasize what unites and not what divides us. Working for the unity of purpose with a stronger vision for a better tomorrow. NTA, growing with the nation. Nigeria, the only country we can train with remarkable potentials to excel. Let us believe in ourselves and change our attitude for the sake of our country and generations unborn. Let us revive our cultural values which are our essence as a nation. Let us renew the spirit of patriotism and hope in our dear country. Do not take or give bribe. Be punctual always. No more African time. We can't expect to be global citizens and operate on African time. Join the queue. Insist that people are attended to on a first-come basis no matter who they are or where they come from. Nigeria, good people, great nation. Make you report any crooked person, object, or wakajube movement to police and security agent demo. The security of our nation now work for all of us, so plus including me and you. Nigeria, make we unite against terrorism. Now, Federal Minister of Information and Culture, bring on this message. Tuesday Live, a network issue oriented innovation talk show. Thanks for staying with us. Now, from the studio, we look out the cameras to talk to the citizens. Here's what they're saying. Let us see ways of putting things together for ourselves. Beyond looking for jobs, there are other things that we can do. Now, one of the things we can do is to go for a self-help project. You want to help yourself, develop yourself, think of what you can do to affect society. That's just my, my, my area of concern. And also, for us to be true leaders of tomorrow, the way we claim to be, we must try to possess some principles. A oh, very good uh, achievement. 19 years without uh, any interrupt. And I think that's very good for the country. And I want every one of us to pray for the leadership of uh, President Mahmoud Buhari. For having uh, come this way after 19 years of uninterrupted uh, civilian regime, uh, our major, we have achieved so many, but the unfortunate thing is that what we have not been able to achieve is uh, the electricity sector. There's need for improvement. You can't believe some, uh, some of these countries that have visited just uh, neighbor, our neighbors, you hardly see generator. But in Nigeria, we're still using generator. So uh, please, uh, we need to improve on that sector. And once we are able to improve on that sector, you go a long way 
to create more job opportunity for, uh, for the youths because industries will be functional without any interruption. Because they came to tell us that change mantra in terms of um, human capital development, in terms of infrastructures, score those patients. There is nothing to write them about. Why am I saying so? I have really, really traveled to, by road, some of the country, not by air, I decided to take that by road. I'll be able to see that. They say they have put about one point something trillion naira in road in construction. I've not really seen the impact of that. First of all, I congratulate Nigerians for 19 years uninterrupted democracy. But the issue is the government, the Nigerian leaders are insensitive. There's unemployment, there's hunger in the land. The light you are talking about, have we seen the light? Can we say uh, 10 hours of the day we will have uh, light? No. The education sector is in comatose. At 19, we expect a matured democracy. But unfortunately, the spirit of discontinuity has affected us. Within the last 10 years, we've had a series of government from Obasanjo, Yaradua, good luck to Buhari. But it's difficult for them to actually continue from where a particular president stopped. Apart from good luck, who tried a little to start from or to continue from where Yaradua stopped, that's been a problem. Looking at Nigeria these past three years, there's been a complete lacuna between the former government they met and what we have now because of um, pushing of blames where a government is failing they push the blame on the former government rather than correcting what they already saw before coming to power so for me i think uh, this continuity has really killed us at 19 instead of looking at the future a child of 19 should be thinking of how to settle down but in nigeria at 19 we are thinking of how to begin a fresh country and that is the problem of our country. The voice of the people there, but um, back here in the studio, I did say we'd look at how well the country has performed within the last three years, particularly in the issue of corruption and uh, then uh, with the security to lives and property. Let's look at corruption, the anti corruption <coughs> pattern. Well, well Cyril, before I go into that, I want to make a quick observation. We have a lot of problems and ronco all over the country, which includes security and some economic issues. But what are the root causes of this? The root causes of this is that, for example, I spoke about strong institutions. Political parties are part of these institutions. There is no political party. Take my own APC. For the last four years, the board of trustees of the party had never met. And I attended only one national caucus meeting of the party. These are environments where people from different parts of the country come to talk about issues and be educated. And when they go back, they can educate their communities on what the government is doing. Now, this lack of communication between the government and the governed is the source of major problems that we find ourselves deep inside in this country. And as far as we could not establish that nexus of communication between the people and government, we would ever continue to have, I'm coming, mm -hmm. we would ever continue to have problems. And this answers the issue Farouk was trying to raise and the issues Mamora was trying to raise. Farouk had been in these trenches for a long time. Mamora came in 2015. He was even educating people on certain concepts of this change. He is excluded. People who have no locals, interlopers and intruders took over government. What do you expect them to say or do? They don't know anything about why even the party was formed. How do they communicate with the people? 
I'm coming. In the issue of corruption, people make a lot of wild observations on this because they think that they see certain people living in affluence, but because the people are connected and because the people are close to those in authority, they are not being investigated. But the issue, if I were an advisor on this matter, and if I can say my mind, we are misdirecting the fight against corruption. The fight against the corruption is not to chase political enemies or to catch people and send to jail. Why can't we try another aspect of it, another way of fighting corruption? Preventive. You don't, just like the policeman, will, will stand by the corner and allow you to commit an offense before he arrests you. Why does he have to allow you to commit the offense? And there are a lot of ways you can reduce corruption in this country that it will not even happen. If I'm a consultant, I will give a 1,000 page view on how it could be done and it would be effective. I'm coming. And even the issue of security that we are talking about, we say a lot of things. Take Zampara. People are killed day and night and the information about the killings are being suppressed. And other people on the other side see it as just sectional, that government is responsible because they are ignorant. The people that are being killed in Zamfara are nearly equal to people that were being killed in Yobe, Adamawa, and Borno. The governor is never found there. Anytime. I'm sure in the last seven years that he was governor, he never slept seven times in the capital of, of Zampara. Is it not a serious issue? What I want, or what I would want to say is that in the issue of fighting, for example, insurgency, it is not for the military, because I made a statement on BBC, and the military replied me by calling a world press conference in Maiduguri and called me a liar. Let me say it is history. But what I'm suggesting is that for you to fight this insurgency and deal with it once and for all, the military must be prepared to move, take territory, and hold. They cannot stay in one place in trench unless they are attacked. Then they respond. It will never work because for 1,000 years, the insurgency will continue to be there because those people are on the other side, you are on this side. Oh. This is my All right. take we'll, on this. Okay, we'll return to that. But we have a caller on the line from Kaduna. Sani calling in from Kaduna. Hello, Sani. Right, we lost that call from uh, Sunny there. I think we need right. to correct an impression mm -hmm. that um, he made mm. uh, that it's only political opponents that this government is going after. That's the I view of many people. I didn't I say that's what they are doing. Okay. It is the view yeah, but of we, we, majority of the people. Okay. Now, but you need, go to the to, streets, say, Festus, Festus, Festus. You go to the streets, they will tell you they are arranging to, they are trying, they will arrest this, they will arrest that next tomorrow, they will do this. And all the people that are being mentioned erroneously or rightly are people that are viewed as political opponents or political competitors. Okay. Yes, but then when you say okay. it is a majority, it is not right also for you to say it's majority view. Where is the majority coming from? Where did you do the census? That you know it's majority view. It's just a view by those people who are fighting back when corruption is fighting them. Right. It is the views of the opposition. And I have said it over and over again that because okay. we help them to repeat these things, people now think it is true. It is not true. The president cannot sit down in his office and say, it's, I'm going after political opponents alone. People have been sacked from this government who have been indicted. They have been, they have been investigated now. They've been taken to court. People, people, APC members are in court. APC governors are in court. They are being tried. APC members are in court. It is an APC member. So why is it, why would somebody just wait? And when they repeat this and we help them to repeat it, people think it is true. It is not true. It's just not true. Care. I don't think it's All right, it's let's uh, quickly take this call from Joseph and we'll return and get the other views on corruption. Joseph calling in from Bielsa. Hello, Joseph. Joseph, are you there? Yeah, hello. Um, yes, go right ahead, Joseph. Yeah, uh, my own contribution is that uh, this country 
for the institutions to be strengthened in this country, I think there should be a steady power supply. Because that will enable the institutions to function in such a way that will increase the, the rate of employment. Then, according to the, the not young rule, <coughs> like uh, my, my elder said there rightly, it's just that law is basically for, for the uh, children of the rich. If the monetized political system is not reduced in the country, that will not come to the, the, the children of the poor. So then that aside, um, the, gov the, the president in his bid is trying best the level of insincerity among the, uh, the appointees is too much. Someone will come on air talking that, that are not real. That will not the country to. All right, Joseph. Right. Thanks for calling in. Okay. So, yes, Dr. Yes, Abayu, how, how far will the corruption fight? Well, the first thing is that in any nation, the level of poverty makes the struggle against corruption very difficult. And it also makes security a very difficult task. Because it's, it's not very easy for a society that knows uncaring poverty to have peace, order, or good government. So we must understand that even in well-endowed uh, nations, it's not the issue of security <coughs> is not an easy, easy ordeal to, to work on, you know. But I believe that the government, one of, in any go, every, every government's first and first responsibility is to ensure the security of the people. And um, uh, the, the, the complication of the situation in this country makes it a little bit um, challenging. Well, if you look at coming to government, the government is facing a Boko Haram, fighting, fighting insurgency. It made substantial progress. And just as the nation is making progress, we now face what is called uh, herdsmen. So the fundamental needs to be, to be, to be faced. And I do agree with, um, with him that um, the issue is not just uh, looking at it from a superficial perspective. You've got to go into the, the foundation to identify what are the major problems. Even if we look at this nation, I think that the tendency, the racial, the, the state in Nigeria is, the less it has a capacity for <coughs> insurgency. As far as, as, as far as I can see. So I believe that if we want to reduce the problem of insecurity and we want to reduce the problem of corruption, we must increase individual worth and the worth of the nation. You cannot, for example, pay a, 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 a director in a ministry, in, in government, uh, maybe something like 300,000, which is about how much they are paid per annum. And then you expect that he will train his child, he would, uh, <laughs> he would have a house, he would uh, maintain his life, he will have vehicle, and then he will have access to public money. You, and you will expect that uh, he won't uh, be tempted by it. So you've got to find a way to deal with the fundamental root of corruption and the fundamental root of a whole lot of problems of this nation is poverty. The Bible says, do not make me so poor that I will curse you. So even the Bible recognizes that extreme poverty can lead to a, a dangerous situation. All right. Let's take this call from Abuja, Moses. I believe Moses calling in from Abuja. Hello, Moses. Good evening. Good evening. I just want to talk on, uh, I will want to commend the present administration. I also want to uh, appreciate 
I will thank God for the 19 years of uh, the democracy, uh, democratic rule in Nigeria. But I want to say something to you. That if a child, uh, your child is about 19 years old and is still crawling, you won't be happy. You know, uh, just like Alaji Buba said, Buhari, our president, is, is, is a great man. And we all respect him. We thank God for the way God is using him. But this is not uh, what what we uh, we do because I, I was part of the people that started this this, this 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 journey, and this is not what exactly we plan that the administration would be. In a nutshell, I will just talk on the economy, where the, His Excellency have tried so much, and the present administration have tried on the economy, on infrastructure, and so on and so forth. But we have a lot to do on the economy. I want to mention, so I want to. Hello. To rely on the on the on uh, on China and America and so much for, for our for, for our economic growth at all. There is something we call a financial engineering. Nigeria should look inward if we really we want to develop economically. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, let's let's take this question back to uh, Senator Mamura. And see just how well we ask how well we have performed in the fight against corruption and with the cases of insurgency, and uh, if indeed this is the way to go. Okay. Uh, thank you, Cyril. But uh, quickly before I come to the question, I think uh, I must not fail to address the, the issue of the executive and uh, the leg legislative uh, relationship. Uh, we, I think it's important for us not to be misconstrued out there, particularly from some of the submissions of uh, my colleagues on this program. You see, the, 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 the powers of the legislature in terms of you know, inviting people and all that, they are, they are not just limited to sections 88 and 89. No. Uh, of course, the constitution is clear you know, in terms of uh, who can be invited. If every minister who's, I mean, at a point in time that the legislature is discussing matters that affect the, that ministry or department, the legislative house has powers to invite the minister involved. But having said that, of course, that, that the, 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 in fact, what the constitution is, shall attend. The, the, the uh, president also has a right of attendance, right of attendance, to present matters of uh, national importance and what have you. Now, but having said that, we must appreciate that every power, whether it is executive power, legislative power, or judicial power, every power is subject to abuse. That is why power has to be exercised with caution. That is why the executive is prone to executive lawlessness, the legislature is prone to legislative rascality, and the judiciary is prone to judicial recklessness. These are things that have been established in any democratic system. And every, it's not just the executive, it's not just the legislature, uh, legislative function, uh, checking the executive. The legislature can be checked by the executive and the judiciary. The judiciary can be checked by the two other arms, that is, the, 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 the uh, executive and the legislature. The, legisl the, the judiciary can be checked by the executive and the legislature. They all check themselves. It is erroneous to, think, to say that or think that it's just executive that checks or the legislature that checks the executive. No, they all check themselves one way or the other. That's the position in reality, in practice. Now, having said that, there is need for synergy. I repeat, synergy. The Constitution talks of separation of powers in terms of functions and roles. But I always caution again that this separation of powers should not be overstretched. Because if you are talking of absolute separation of powers, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the president will not need to send the budget to the, to, to the legislature 
but for approval before it can be uh, assented to and then uh, implemented. Again, if, 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 if it's total separation, the names of uh, judicial officers will not be sent to the legislature for confirmation before they can start to operate. So I'm trying to say that what, what I always push for is interdependence. And finally, it's important to note that the legislature is the fulcrum on which democracy revolves. Remove the legislature, then you have autocracy. The legislature, over the, because of our, uh, the reality of our democratic uh, or the, the, or, of, of the, the reality of our democratic experience and uh, history, the legislature has been the most or the least developed and the most abused. Because over each time the military came into office, the legislature would be under lock and key. So the development has been stunted. That is the, that's the reality. And a lot of that's why people will go to legislators and be asking them to come and do roles for them to come and do. No, it's not part of the function of the, of the legislature. Now, back to this government came into being on three kernels. See, uh, security fights, insurgency, of course, uh, the, uh, the um, fight uh, corruption, and of course, fix the economy. And on the three, on the three grants, the, 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 this government has, I mean, let's give it to this government, reasonably has done well on these three uh, issues. Yes, they, they are, there might have been some um, area. In a moment on the issue of corruption, let's just take this call that's on, uh, uh, coming from Musa in Jigawa State. We'll return to you in a moment. Um, Musa, go right ahead. Good evening. How are you, sir? Yes, go ahead quickly. I just want to I just want to ask the two constitutional lawyers, or rather the first lawyer and the other lawyer right. in the discussion. Uh, yeah, uh, I want I want to ask what what are the what are the what are the primary what are the primary objective what are the primary work of the legislature? Okay. I, I asked I had him saying that uh, why must a legislature, I mean, keep working on, 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 on budgets? You shouldn't have worked on budgets. And the other person say that, that uh, um, uh, there are a lot of inconsistencies in the system by, made by the, 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 the legislators, saying that they have, they, 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 they have a shortcoming in, 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 in their legislation and uh, they, have, they, they are overshooting on the constitution. And I learned that uh, legislators are the custodian of the constitution. They are the custodian of the public funds. They are the, they are, they, I mean, they, 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 they conduct oversight. And what is, what, 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 what is the meaning of oversight? I think it's to check and uh, check, the, check and the balance of the order, to check the exit of the executive in any system that is in, I mean, in, 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 in practice. And, and but but he said uh, but two lawyers have just went and attacked the legislators. Well, my brother has made mention of they should be respected. Even though the other lawyer was saying something that uh, they should be respected, but all the time he has said a lot of things against them. Is there anything bad when a legislator refuses or rather invites an executive for something that people need to understand on issues? I mean issues. All right. Legislators are more closer to 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 to, to, to electors. Okay. The executive and, 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 and they have a mandate. Okay, all right, but thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Musa from uh, Jigawa. You've made your point. I'm sure our guests will they will comment, they'll, they'll, they'll respond to the issues you raised. But let's return to uh, Lagos because uh, we did uh, cut off Senator Mamurai in the middle of uh, his talk about uh, the successes this government has scored in the fight against corruption. Senator Mamura, sorry that I had to ask you to pause a while the other time, but please just round off what you were saying about the successes scored uh, on, on, uh, in the fight against corruption. Okay. Again, uh, quickly, I mean, it's, it's, well, it's the, the last caller, essentially, the first function of a legislator is representation. You are elected as a representative of the people. That was the first thing, to represent the people. Two is lawmaking. And 
your lawmaking function will arise from your effective and efficient representation of your people. It's knowing their problems that will make you make good laws. The third one is oversight. And of course, the fourth is legitimizing rule. That is confirmation of appointments and all that. You have to legitimize. It's not just through appointment. They have to legitimize. So those are the major functions. Every other function will then revolve around it. Now back to the issue. In terms of uh, fighting insurgency, there is no doubt this government has uh, reduced the potency of Boko Haram. That is a statement of fact. Again, the Dapchi girls, they were safely returned, except uh, Leah Sharibu. That, and I know that government is making efforts to ensure safe return of Leah Sharibu because it's a sore point, and uh, I know government is taking, is doing everything possible to, to achieve this. Again, you recall that even on Mr. President's last visit, last visit to, the, to, to, to the U.S., President Trump, we, we, the, the U.S. has now uh, agreed to sell to us, and we have paid. We have made part payment to, to, to have uh, some fighter agents that will help this, this uh, government in uh, um, fighting remnants of insurgency that you, you have. Of course, other, other security issues have arisen, like the, um, the husband, farmers, and all that. And of course, efforts have been made because this uh, is something that has a, a, a kind of um, a very long uh, standing in the history of this country. But efforts have been made in that direction. In terms of uh, uh, fighting corruption, again, don't forget that uh, there are components of this. You have you, first, you need to do thorough investigation. You need to do thorough prosecution. Without thorough investigation, without thorough prosecution, you cannot have conviction. But recently, a former governor, and that is, that is a, a high point, was convicted and jailed. So that is something. And of course, there are a lot of even APC bigwigs who still have cases in court, ongoing. It's, a law, it's just not an executive action. It requires the input and, in fact, the final thing by the uh, judiciary through the court. And everybody has a role to play in uh, the court. That's why the government put up this uh, whistleblower uh, thing, which is, again, it has uh, helped the government in uh, um, you know, fighting this corruption issue. Of course, if you TSA, the, the, the treasury account. It's a way of fighting corruption. And so much has been saved from, from, from that process. The ghost workers thing, uh, we, we have less ghosts. If at all we have ghosts, in, in, and so much has been saved, over 200 billion saved on a monthly basis. That is also fighting corruption, because it's through corruption that these ghosts exist. Again, if you now move to the issue of economy, so much too has been achieved to the extent that we are almost becoming self-sufficient in, in, in rice production in this country. Again, you were, some of this, uh, you, you can see the external reserve has risen so much. Uh, ease of doing business is also has to do with the economy. And of course, you can see that we are beginning to export even uh, cassava. So, so much is being achieved and uh, so the government has, uh, has uh, pushed out the achievements in, in, in that sector is so, so much uh, is there. So much. We'll, we'll put these other things uh, to uh, the other discussions, but I, I want to sum up our next set of questions with just four, three or four tweets that have come here, and uh, they encapsulate everything we've been talking about, so that uh, you might just look at them holistically. Uh, this one from F.A.T. Williams says, the bitterness that gave birth to PMB presidency in 2015, and the grandeur corruption that pervades the land are not issues that will bring sweetness easily. We are a people tied to lies in the past. The truth now stares us in the face, and we will. Uh, then this other one from Isa Ahmed Mukhtar says, my elders on the national TV, my question is this. What's the way forward? Uh, to reunite just the way 
it to uh, return to just the way it was in the 80s, be it APC, PDP, Muslims, Christians, Hausa, Yoruba, Ibu, Nigerians must reunite. Thank God. Uh, thank you and God bless. Okay. Then, of course, the last one, I said three or four. The fourth one here from Ezeme Kachi says, with the way we fight corruption in Niger Nigeria, we can't do much. I concur with al Haji Galadima on preventing corruption than fighting opposition. The president is distracted with the way he's fighting this corruption. Forget about the past and purge the government of corruption. So let's hear it from that what, bit. Two, two things. What uh, you say about the insurgency? Yes. We are so quick to forget. You and I sitting in Abuja here. When the police headquarters was bombed, UN headquarters was bombed this day. Uh, um, MAP. So many places. From here to go to Kano, you'll probably reach, get 20, 30 checkpoints. Now they're not there. And so I, I, I mean, we can give this government 99.9%, honestly, in reducing this nonsense that uh, was troubling all of us. And look, this is the first time because of all these issues that the government has set up military, can, not cantonment, division in Zamfara State, in Gusau, to fight these, you know, insurgency and so on, herdsmen, whatever, killers, in Benue, in other parts of the country. But then the cooperation of the citizens is also needed because if the citizens don't give information, if citizens collaborate, if citizens don't say this is where these people are, there are limitations to what security agencies will do. And honestly, I think the security agencies are doing very well. But my, my advice, my honest advice to the probably president, the, the service chiefs need to go, all of them, so that there will be new immigration in the military cadre. So they will know that, look, somebody is in charge. What is the fault of President Buhari if girls in Dabchi were kidnapped? You remember in this country, Chuba girls were taken. How dare the military wear off their guards to allow this Boko Haram to go to Dabchi? So some of them should be fired. Somebody should be held responsible. In that regards, that's the only you know, issues I think I have that, look, they need to go. The same way you got Boratai, there are one million and one Boratai in the military. So that these, the people behind them can also grow. Now, fight against corruption. This government has done, if there is what is called 101 percent. The amount of money that is recovered is humongous. And it is true, it's not a lie. These monies are there. They are saved. And in this country, if you, if you and I should remember that, look, this is where $2.1 billion were shared on a dining table. And how dare, like my colleagues in the National Assembly, now if one is accused of corruption or anything, the whole assembly will go to court. You know, what are we trying to show? What are we trying to tell people that would, that some people are above the law? Let me tell, uh, uh, like what Mamora said. The governor, Jolie Inyame, that was jailed, is an APC member, a member of the APC. The Senate president is an APC member. So many of them are from in APC. But look, the corruption will fight back, and it's fighting back. I am appealing to us, Nigerians, that look, you, the masses, don't follow us, the elites. Don't go and get, you know, let me, let me give an example of this of a robbery. Whatever happened, whatever happened, 30 people were killed. 30 died just like that. If it were my son, I am telling you there will be, you know, I will just go everywhere. But I saw on TV today, people, some people in the offer, coming to say, look, we are with our leader. It is, we are happy. You know, masses, crazy people. If somebody is being asked to explain, should there be problem? So this is the corruption issue. Oh, this is corruption. I mean, the government is just trying to say, look, go and answer your charges. 
If you are clean, you are clean. If you are not, you are not. And just like what I said, if anybody thinks that this government is after opposition, someday, one day, we will not be in power. Let them go after us. So that someday, one day, this vicious cycle will stop. You will not steal money because you know so you, well, if you think you are being covered. And I assure you, look, I know. I know as a person. The, of course, people that work for the president, some high, some, I mean, somewhere along the line, they make mistakes. Do you know why Buhari continues to be healthy, looking healthy, and so on? Because I am sure God sees his intention, that he has good intention. Probably people working to ensure that his intention are actualized. There are problems here and there. But I also confirm to you that if Buhari's son is caught, doing anything wrong, I swear with my holy books he will put him to the gallows. So that's it, and people are not used to that. We had a president here who protected his children. But now we have somebody who said, look, go and answer your charges. And then we, the elites, are saying, no, look, this is election year. I mean, people bombard us, like, why are you behaving like this? Why do you fight these people? Don't you want to win election? And Mr. President, we confronted him. He said, look, let me not win election if because of going after these people, I will lose election. That's the kind of person we're looking for. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we're in the last few minutes of this program, and uh, there's something well, that's extremely yeah. important. Uh, you all have talked about um, strengthening institutions. And, um, well, I do agree with um, uh, yeah. Honorable Galadima. Yes, but I am asking. I, I, I tend to be confused sometimes. You talk about institutions, strengthening them. Isn't it people who are going to strengthen those institutions? The institutions can't strengthen themselves, can they? Well, so what is, what is the process of recruiting people who are meant to look after the strengthening of those institutions? If they are faulty, isn't it a fault from the, from the start? Yeah, institutions are crucial for the growth of democracy. But people run now, the institutions. Uh, let me just say quickly to show you the, the problem of this nation. If we look at Western countries, institutions fight against uh, individuals who want to corrupt those institutions. But if we look at our country, it's only individuals that try to reform, to reform, for reform. In fact, institution fights against them. So that's why we're not making, I completely agree with him that institutions are correct. But how do you reform the institution? You reform institutions by rules and the law that guide them. You reform institutions by norms, existing norms. You also reform institutions by leaders, appropriate leaders. Because people stand for something. So if, if how can, do you recruit the leaders? People cannot, well, the, the people are reformed through education, norms, and so on and so forth. And people said, for example, in my case, when I first joined politics, people said that they were, they, you have to rig election in order for you to win. I said, no, it can't happen. In the last time I, I ran for governorship, I won five votes. Five votes out of 3,000. That's all. I call them five honorable votes. And they are honorable because I said, I can never, never, never bribe you to vote for me. I will not put you in any hotel and feed you because I want your vote. And I will not give you money. Simple. People must stand up for something or they fall for anything. Unless you are willing to make a sacrifice for change, for, for, for good government. We are not going to go and have a good government. So institution is made up of rules, norms, and people. All right. Well, I think the relationship between institutions and the persons, so it's, it's symbiotic. Mm -hmm. Nobody should think that it's just institutions who stand alone and function alone. Mm -hmm. I've always argued somewhere that strong persons are also need to also strengthen these institutions. Right. Because if it were not so, if the institutions function without persons, why do you call for CVs? You look at CVs of people before you put them in positions because this, the people are also essential mm. to run the institution. If you turn also just carry, carry a mechanic to go and run the Ministry of Finance. Yeah. If you think the Ministry of Finance can run without that, but you look for somebody with the correct CV to run the Ministry of Finance. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Let us not repeat this thing we repeat all the time that strong institutions, we don't need strong men. We need strong men to strengthen the institutions. Mm. There's corruption everywhere in the world, but let me tell you the difference between 
some African countries and the other, you know, Western countries. If some people are caught, you know, in corrupt practices, in the Western world, they, they will protect the institution and sacrifice yes, you. Exactly. But in this place, yes. they will rather sacrifice the institution and protect the person. No institution and norms. No institution and norms. They will protect the person and sacrifice the institution. That's the difference. So we must look for strong people to also enforce those rules. I agree with my colleagues that the rules make up the strong institution. Rules and precepts and standards. Those standards must be enforced and maintained. So we should not ethnicize corruption. Like my friend said, once uh, somebody is accused of corruption, the whole village comes out, he's a village person. They don't look at the facts. The first thing you hear is that they are trying to oppress our person, our son. And in Nigeria, they see it as betrayal if you are not supporting a man from your own area. They say you are betraying. And that is the, that is the kind of mentality we must change. We must not ethnicize everything and turn it down to uh, tribal or Christians or, you know, religious sentiments. People, the institutions should function without these sentiments and function according to rules and regulations. That is just how to make sure the institutions are strengthened. All right. Uh, uh, Cyril, I, I have a very, very big problem mm. on this issue. All right. Uh, we have two categories of Nigerians that are very detriment to the progress of this country. The ignorant and the psychophants. These two classes of people will never unchain our country to realize its potentials. And our leaders are such that they are looking for compliant and psychophants to put in position. Why? Wouldn't be why wouldn't I be anything? Because I can look straight into anybody's eyes and tell him my mind. And they know that. That is why they can avoid me. So unless we have leaders with a large heart to bring people, strong-willed people, not compliant people, and put them in position, then the institutions can be strengthened. But if you bring a compliant person, somebody who has no fixed address just because he's related to you, either by marriage or by blood, and put him there. Definitely he cannot oppose what is wrong. This is, a, this is my problem, and this I see as a major problem of the country. Therefore, strengthening the institutions are a very, very difficult and high-stake hmm. wahala. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, finally, on this program, um, Senator Mamura, I will just ask you a, a question. It's not about firming the institutions now, but uh, something that uh, was mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the Not Too Young to Run Act. And uh, some have raised worries about uh, who really would be the beneficiaries of this act. What do you think? Quickly, Senator Mamura. Well, I. You see. The, the, the not too young, it's not yet Uhuru for them because uh, elections are not won through sloganeering. Elections are won through ability to organize, ability to network, ability to strategize. So these are the things that they need, the not too young, they need to develop. It's not just about the slogan, I mean, not too young to wrong is a slogan as far as I'm concerned. Yes, it's a step in the right direction. Thank, I, I, I'm happy that Mr. President signed the thing into law. They need to organize, they need to reach out, they need to strategize and ensure that uh, those things that my colleagues there have said in terms of uh, what we need to look out for is uh, leadership recruitment, proper leadership recruitment process, so that the right people are in the legislature, the right people are in the executive, the right people are manning the MDAs. Not the psychophants, not the praise singers. We need that for us to have um, a better society. And then, so on that note, we'd like to thank you very much for coming on this program. Uh, Senator Lorunimbe Mamura, we thank you very much for sharing your time with us. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, thank you also, Buba Galadiva, former National Secretary 
uh, Congress for Progressive Change. That's um, uh, one of the parties that... Um, a, a new convert to the NTS table. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. thank, you. Thank, thank you for coming on this program. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. And, uh, well, a big thank you to Festus Kiyamo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, uh, Director of Strategic Communications, the Buhari 2019 Presidential Campaign. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. And uh, Dr. Tunji Abayomi, it's always a pleasure to have you join us. Thank My you pleasure. for being here thank tonight. You. My thank pleasure. You. Thank you. Okay. And then thank you also to Farouk Adamu Aliu, who is a former member of the House of Representatives. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you, Cyril. All right. And uh, thank you also for being part of this program. Next week, we'll reach you again on NTA Tuesday Live. I'm Cyril Stober. Bye for now. NTA, Nigerian Television Authority. For more information and news update, visit our website at www.nta.ng or you can follow us on Twitter at NTA News Now or you can like us on Facebook at NTA Network News. Stay connected on our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash NTA News Online. Watch our live stream at www.nta.ng slash live. NTA, you can't beat the rich. NTAE brings you the best of entertainment. I thought I was being sarcastic. I went on to do other productions. Mm -hmm. Everything music. Which one you see? If you look at the platform, you can see what's the black product? The color new school plays. That's in the hot one. We go carry the hair of one of them. And the smell is it. Somebody sad, you feel it. I love you. I love you. Ah, just a little. I know of this. Chop, they are already washed. It is all a mindset. Delicious. What else can I do? Get a shower for me and dance as well. Watch these programs and more on NTA Entertainment Channel 105 on Star Times. NTAE, your one stop entertainment channel. The history of art is as old as the history of man. Man by nature is artistic when it comes to how it relates to his environment. Life is said to be an expression of beauty and art, where different materials or things are used to beautify the environment and even the human body. The beautification of the human body tells a story of different cultures, but one commonly found in this part of the country is the henna designs. The precision in henna design is a wonder as the creative nature of man is brought to play.
Disaster occurs on frequent basis. Some we hear of, others we do not. Terrorism. Flood. Fire. Earthquake. Car or plane crashes. Building collapse and even armed robbery. Each bringing assets and revenue loss, human mortality, and in 90% of survivors, great loss of hope. Flooding is the most common of all environment hazards, and it regularly claims over 20,000 lives per year and adversely affects about 75 million people worldwide. Nigeria has had its fair share. As the name implies, are not set out to happen, but they can be planned or budgeted for. Disaster management may not avert emergency threats, but it will decrease the impact of disaster where well handled. It then brings to the fore the key phases to management of disaster. Mitigation, response, recovery, preparedness and prevention. Every citizen must be well acquainted with all of them. Wishing disaster away does not avert it. Rather, as put in the local palace, a man of valor is only identified at a time of emergency. Let us always be prepared. This is the network service of the NDA. Valentine showroom deal is here. Valentine showroom deal. Yes, it's the We Connect showroom of love. Take advantage of this great offer from February 1, 2018. The showroom offers fantastic discounts and lots of freebies on gift items and special packages, including perfumes, red roses, chocolate, quality shirts, mobile phones, and a free gift for orders above 20,000 naira. Leaving your Valentine breathless. Order now from the showroom at www.weconnect.ng forward slash shopping. We connect. You need it. We got it. Firmino, Liverpool have their perfect start. Philip Coutinho scores his first Liverpool goal. Actually, um, football has been my part since when I was young. Um, because of the, the reason why I really fall in love with football is that when I was growing up in my house, Every one of us we're in love with soccer and you know football there are a lot of arguments coming out from it you know you argue it makes you your enemy to be your friends during that moment so with time i grew up just falling in love with this 
our game. So that is why I love football. Firmino, Liverpool have their perfect start. Philip Coutinho scores his first Liverpool goal. The moment, uh, that's, that's where my, my club, Chelsea, um, won the uh, Champions League. Yeah, the, that moment it was very exciting. Uh, I so much uh, love that moment. The reason because during that period um, we are we are behind in that uh, EPL table because everyone they've been saying that we are the next uh, Champions League we are not going to be to feature. But we need that Champions League that give us automatic qualification to that to the next Champions League. That was the reason why it makes me that moment I cannot forget uh, ever so much. And the argument and the a lot of things that is coming out of that moment, uh, my friends that have been making jest of me, that my club is going down, we are losing form, you know, that thing makes me to fall in love and make that period a favorite time for me. For me now, Liverpool I love Chelsea is that um, Chelsea one from the color blue. Blue is my favorite color, so that makes me the first reason why I love that club. And two, the the the, the kind of players that they invested on during the time I fell in love with them. Um, during the time of uh, Balak and then um, our Nigerian player Mikel Obi and. Every one of them now makes me. I mean, I have a lot of favorite players among them, but I know that Balak was my first favorite player in Chelsea. But now, if I will choose, I will choose Fabregas. Может и лучше для Арсенала получится. Передача опять на Арана Рэмзи. Удар с рикошета. Рэмзи. Рэмзи идея из центра идет. Удар, ну конечно. Действительно, очень трудно среагировать было на этот удар Джордану Пикфорду. Допустим, мгновение у Вандерсара в Манчестер Юнайт. Как впечатление, что он не видит. Прекрасная передача. Мхитарян, Абамиян. Тай. Афсай. Сработали с ним в ней игру бесспорная. И безусловно. Янга за Арсенал и второй пас Генриха Мхитаряна. Ну, туда налево надо было пораньше, наверное, играть все-таки. Удар и гол! Плашинс ни по кому не работает, да? Каждый из которых он двое крупнее. И он даже не выпрыгивает на этот спал просто-напросто. И Доминик Калверт Льюн отыгрывает один. Китарян, прекрасно, Рэмзи! И поскольку газон-то мокрый, все одно чуть слабее до что втором тайме, этот отбор уже видит а на Рэмзи, который под него вот, все-таки ему подопорно бьет. Рэмзи очень плотно и вот.
Здесь двое, трое игроков Тоттенхэма сообща начудили, а Давинсон Санчес, Киран Трипье и добрый вечер Эрик Дайер. И египтянин выводит Ливерпуль вперед. В полнейшем замешательстве оборона. А прострел касания Кариус и удар Бориса Кариуса. Вот здесь он сыграл четко, не сумел поймать спящий с полулета. Ну фантастика, ну удивительные мечища забежали. Ядро от только вышедшего на поле кенийского опорника. То... Удивительный расклад по владению мячом, а здесь Харич на Кейна. Там вообще-то был отсайд, дорогие друзья, но касание... Бьет точно в карю. Его исполнение ничего подобного я припомнить не могу. Просто во вратаре. Так, мяч якобы там в руку попадает, но Салах снова с мячом. Что он вытворяет? Что? Не иначе, как пророк. Ке обыгрывает сколько соперников. И по мини-футбольному со штычка Салах догоняет в гонке бомбардиров чемпионата. А что там был пенальти. Но удар не по мячу, а по ламеле пробил. Он и... саркастически аплодирует. Бил свой сотый. Get ready. Valentine.